Okay. Uh, let me know if that camera goes off at any point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that we don't lose our whole lecture. Uh, okay. So, quick recap in case there's anyone that we're stuck on a little bit, need refreshing on before we start today. Uh, so, today we'll be covering uh, Parmenides, so I'll mention the ones that are most relevant to him, but starting really quick with Thales, hopefully you remember Thales, father of everything, the one stuff is water. Next one was Anax or yeah, Anaximander, he's the one that said it was the Pyrrhon, the indefinite, the boundless. Now, his notion is going to be relevant when we talk about Zeno. So remember that he's mixing up these three words together, the infinite, the indefinite, and the boundless. We're going to see that Greeks are confused in distinguishing those three from each other as we talk about Zeno today. Uh, Anaximenes, he's the one that says it's all just air, and he's the one that gave the process of condensation and rarefication for how the elements switch. Uh, Xenophanes is going to be uh, our precursor to Parmenides. So Xenophanes was most likely a teacher of Parmenides. Remember, he's the one that used the weird language. He says, uh, God is all-knowing, God is everywhere, everything's God, but in a very physical sense. So he thought that God was co-existent with the entire universe, which makes me a part of God. Now, one of the funny things he said about God is God doesn't change, he's motionless, and yet I'm part of the universe, so I'm part of God, I move all the time. How are we going to reconcile those two? So we're going to see Parmenides picks up with where Xenophanes left off and tries to make Xenophanes more coherent is one of the things he's going to do. And then he's going to be completely opposed to Heraclitus. He's the most important one we need to remember in talking about Parmenides. So Heraclitus says that everything is changing in every respect at every time. The world is a Heraclitian flux. Everything flows, nothing abides. There is only change. Identity is an illusion. There are no real entities out there. Remember that? Okay. And then Pythagoras, he's the one we talked about last week. Um, he was the first of the Italian philosophers, but uh, Xenophanes seems to have more of an effect on how, where Parmenides picks up than Pythagoras. So, any questions about any of these before we go ahead? Heraclitus thought everything was made of fire. Oh, yeah. Heraclitus thought everything was made of fire. Xenophanes said earth and water, or possibly just earth. There's argument about that. And Heraclitus, was he saying fire is the one stuff, or was he just saying, using that as a metaphor for change, and saying the only thing that's consistent is change. That's the only absolute, everything's changing, and use fire as an analogy, some people say that's what he was saying. So, hard to know for sure. With, with these three, we have a pretty well in stone, exactly what they were saying the one stuff is. These two are harder. Here, Pythagorean said the one stuff's number, and they meant that in a very literal sense. It's hard to know exactly what they meant, but whatever they meant, they meant it in a very physical sense. Any other questions? Go ahead. There is a ten-sided dice. There is a ten-sided dice, but it's not regular. Regular meaning look at the face of one of the die. So if, when you look at the face of a tetrahedron, it's a triangle. Regular meaning all these sides are the same length and these angles are the same length. Your ten-sided die looks something like this on its face. That's not a regular shape. Okay. So all your yeah, so all your platonic solids are regular and if you want a proof that those five are the only five, I could give you that if you want, but we'll do it after class. It's not too bad. It would just take like maybe 15 minutes of explanation that probably most people don't care about. So, uh, Any other questions before we go on? All right. So Parmenides of Elia. He's going to be the first of the Eliatic school. In the same way that we talked about the Milesian school, we had a bunch of people from Miletus. Now we're going to get a few from Elia, and we're going to call them Eliatic, starting with Parmenides. He's the first one from Elia. So where is Elia? It's right over here. We're still talking about the Italians now. Before we were talking about the Ionians, and now we're talking about the Italians. Elia is right there. Uh, remember, Pythagoras ended up in Croton right here. So uh, Parmenides is going to know very much about Pythagoreanism. And good chance he was at some point a Pythagorean. And then you might remember when we talked about Xenophanes, he was the one that traveled all over Greece, but he spent a good amount of time in Elia, which is where Parmenides would have been taught by him. Okay, so Parmenides. He was a Pythagorean and also might have been a pupil of Xenophanes. Good chance that he was. And 
uh, we're fortunate with him. He's the first to support his position with reasoned argument that we have extant. We can look at his, what his arguments were and his reasons for holding him. So we don't just get his conclusions. A lot of times Aristotle doesn't restate an entire philosopher's argument. He just says they thought this and just gives the conclusions. Well, with Parmenides, we have enough of him that we actually have his reasoned arguments for why he believes what he believes. And some go so far as to say that he's a father of logic. I think that's taken it really, really far, and you'll see why. He doesn't state any rules of logic explicitly, but he does use the law of contradiction a lot. And we'll see how. Uh, so we have far more of him than we have anyone else thus far. We have, uh, he still argues using poetical language. We have basically a poem of his, and we have the majority of the most important part of the poem. You could go read the entire poem in probably like five to 10 minutes. It's not that big. And you would have read everything that we have of Parmenides. So everyone's just reading that exact poem and saying what it means when they're talking about Parmenides philosophy. So you could become an expert in Parmenides pretty easily. Now, before we jump into his arguments, his arguments, well, first let's go over the law of contradiction and then what his arguments are going to be like. So the law of contradiction. Contradictory propositions cannot both be true in the same sense at the same time, e.g. the two propositions, P is the case, or P is a proposition, and P is not the case, are mutually exclusive, and we typically symbolize it with this tautology. Not P and not P. It is not the case that both P and not P are true. That's always impossible. It's impossible that Donnie is wearing the blue shirt and Donnie is not wearing the blue shirt to both be true. That's impossible. So it is always true that not P and not P. So this whole thing is a tautology. We following the symbols there? Or do we need to plug in values real quick? We're good? Okay. So that is what, uh, this is the law of logic that Parmenides is going to use over and over again, which is why some people call him the father of logic, but he never explicitly states this. Not once does Parmenides say, Here's a fundamental rule of the universe, the law of contradiction. That doesn't happen until Aristotle. Anyways, so the proofs that we're going to get from Parmenides to prove his positions, the proofs used by Parmenides are called reductio ad absurdum proofs. For those of you who have done uh, some proofs in math before, it's the same thing as proof by contradiction. Now, how does a proof like this work? So it's called reductio ad absurdum. He reduces your position to an absurdity to show that it's false. Consider some position, it leads to some absurd conclusion, therefore that position is false. It can't be true, because it being true leads to some absurd conclusion. So he shows that assuming some premise to be true implies that some statement P is both true and false, which is absurd. P cannot be both true and false. So if your premise leads to P being both true and false, your premise is false. It can't be true. That's how these proofs are going to work. According to the law of contradiction, it is impossible for a statement to be both true and false at the same time with the same respect. Therefore, the premise we assume to be true must actually be false. So this is big picture how proof, uh, proof by contradiction or reductio ad absurdum, that's what you call it in a philosophy class, reductio ad absurdum proofs work. So we'll do two simple examples to help you get comfortable with this. And then after that, if you still have questions, let's make sure it makes sense because it's what we're going to be looking for in his arguments. So let's give common sense thinking that you use every day. Imagine that you come to me and you ask me, how long does it take me to commute to work? I say, yeah, five minutes. Well, we go look on my phone really quick and we see how far it is from my house to where I work and we say that's 25 miles. We do a little bit of math and we find out, okay, if I go 25 miles in five minutes, that means I'm traveling 300 miles per hour. We go look up some specs on my car and we find out, actually, my car tops out at 120 miles per hour. Contradiction. My car can't go over 120 miles per hour, and my, well, say it how I wrote here, my car can't go over 120 miles per hour, and my car went over 120 miles per hour. That's impossible. So my premise here, this claim, must be false. My commute to work is not five minutes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, let's look at a simple math one. Math. We're going to claim that there is a largest number. We're going to show that this is impossible. Claim, there's the largest number, we're going to call it x. 
Well, then we let y equal x plus 1. x plus 1 is still a number, so y is still a number. And now y is bigger than x. Contradiction. y is not greater than x, because x is the largest number. And y is greater than x, because of this line. Contradiction. Therefore, there is no largest number. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is roughly how these proofs are going to go. Any questions before we jump into it? Okay. Oh, I guess we're not jumping in yet. So the poem, uh, we have several large portions of his poem, and good reason to believe that we know their order. The poem is split into three major parts. We have the introduction, and then the part that we typically call concerning truth, and then the third part that we call concerning opinion. Now, almost everything that people are referencing when they talk about the philosophy of Parmenides comes from this section of the poem, which also happens to be the portion of the poem that we have the most of. So, worked out pretty nicely there. So almost all of what people are talking about when they talk about the philosophy of Parmenides comes from the concerning true section. There's also a section we have the most of. Okay. So now we'll jump into the poem, give you the first sentence here to give you a taste for it how poetic this stuff still is and not rigorous argument. So, the horses which bear me conducted me as far as desire may go when they had brought me speeding along to the far-famed road of divinity who herself bears onward through all things the man of understanding. Along this road I was born, along this the horses, wise indeed, bore me hastening the chariot on and maidens guided my course. Right, so still very poetical language. Uh, as this goes on, he's going to talk about a goddess. Maybe he already mentioned it there. But So here's how it starts. From here on out, um, Parmenides, so his chariot is going into the sunset. And then the daughters of Helos, the daughters of the sun, guide him through the gates of night and day. And there he runs into a goddess. Now, he is not claiming any type of revelation. This is just a literary device that he's using. The goddess is supposed to be here, a stand-in for wisdom for him. Does that make sense? So, uh, he goes, he runs into the goddess. The goddess tells him that he's far from the beaten path of mortals, and so it's no accident that Parmenides has happened upon her. So what's Parmenides saying there? He's saying he's finally come to have a conversation with wisdom. He had to follow this road intentionally for a very long time. Not many people do. He's one of the fortunate few who have made it all the way to have a conversation here with wisdom. And so wisdom's going to teach him some things. So the god tells him, the goddess tells him what she's going to teach him. It is necessary for thee to learn all things, both the abiding essence of persuasive truth and men's opinion in which rests no true belief. But nevertheless, these things also thou shalt learn, since it is necessary to judge accurately the things that rest on opinion, passing all things carefully in review. So the goddess here is going to learn all things, both the truth, and we might say truth with a capital T, is a way we often say it here, and then the opinions of men. The gospel is going to educate him on both things. Uh, might mention one little side note. You notice that he went through the sun, he's talking to a goddess rather than the god. That might be kind of weird. Why isn't he talking to Apollo? Um, with the Greeks, it's often the case that when you're talking about a particular, you use a masculine, so you talk about a wise man. But when you're talking about an attribute, you use a feminine. So wisdom is feminine. So the goddess would represent wisdom. Justice, they'd represent with lady justice. There would be man justice. So that's one of the ways that you can kind of hint to yourself, oh, they're talking about this abstraction. Um, so the goddess again teaching both things, the way of truth and the way of opinions. And it's interesting that she, I might accidentally say she and he interchangeably here. She, when I talk about the goddess, he because Parmenides wrote this, so don't get confused when I do that. She tells him it's necessary to learn the opinions of men so that he may more accurately judge the things that rest on opinion. So what Parmenides is doing here, he's setting up the two sides of the poem that he's going to give you, the way of truth. And what he's, he's kind of trying to have his cake and eat it too with this poem. With the way of truth, he's going to just completely follow logically the way that things have to be, just based off of thinking about the way the universe is. And it's going to be completely different from the way that the world looks around us. So he's going to say, I'm going to follow my reason to the outskirts. I'm going to call that the way of truth. But I also want to tell you about the way the world appears to us. So I'm going to call that one the way of opinion. 
And so it's his way of being able to tell us both the high things, that it's not the way it appears to us, but the way it really is, and the low things, so he can talk about the same things that Thales, Anaximander, all those other philosophers talked about, the way the universe looks to us. So he's trying to do both. So the most important part of the poem is a part of the poem that we call Concerning Truth. Now, before we go through this, I want to give you a brief summary of what it is saying to give you like an outline of all the arguments that are going to come later so that we don't get lost in the language because the language is kind of weird. So in short, what is he going to argue for in this Concerning Truth? He's going to say what is, is, and what is not, is not, and what is not can neither be nor be thought about. All that exists is existence. What does not exist does not exist. And what does not exist can neither exist nor be thought about. There's existence. There's only existence. There's being. There's only being. There's no non-being. And you can't even think about non-being. You can't even think about nothing. So what is is, what is not is not. We good with that? Got an intuition for what he's saying? And then what is not can either be nor be thought about. Now, we might be comfortable with most of that except for this last part. Uh, what is not can either be nor be thought about. We might say, no, we can think about nothing, right? Can you think about nothing? Well, what does he mean by nothing here? What's some intuition for nothing? When we say nothing, we don't mean think about empty space. We don't mean think about blackness. We don't mean... Think about the word N-O-T-H. Those are all somethings. We mean think about nothing. And some great intuition that I got in thinking about nothing came from an interview I watched a long time ago about, well, what was happening was there was a man who went blind later in his life. So he lived like 20 or so years of his life with regular eyesight. Then something happened and he suddenly went blind. And so he was being interviewed. And in the interview, uh, the questioner asked him, after a bunch of questions, uh, she finally asked him, what was the most surprising thing about going blind? And he says, you always see portrayed in like media, when someone goes blind, it goes dark. I want to tell you, it doesn't go dark. It doesn't go black. I don't see blackness. I don't see. I now see out of my eyes the same thing I used to see out of the back of my head. I don't. I see nothing. There's no conception of seeing anymore. It's gone. He's blind. So that's not blackness. What, what can you see out of the back of your head right now? That's nothing. That's what we're after. Think about nothing. Uh, Aristotle has some nice intuition for describing what nothing is. Aristotle says, what's nothing? It's what rocks dream about. I want you to think about a rock stream. Nothing. So that's what Parmenides is saying here. You can't think about nothing. You can't have a thought about nothing. If you have a thought, it has something to it. Okay, so he's going to say what is is, what is not is not, and what is not can neither be nor be thought about. And then he's going to continue to say what is is, and it is, out with, and it is without beginning and end. It is universal, existing alone, immovable, and eternal. I think that last part's more understandable once we got the first. We'll see arguments for all this yet. No arguments yet. I'm just trying to give you a big picture of everything he's going to argue so that we can take this one little bite at a time. Any big picture questions before we jump into his actual arguments? Okay. And just to be very clear, I've nitpicked little pieces of the poem that I think best encapsulate pieces of the argument. Obviously, I'm passing over stuff. You can go read it yourself to get a better feel for what he's arguing. I just, obviously we can't take all class to just cover one part of the poem. But here's how the concerning truth part starts. Come now, I will tell thee, and do thou hear my word and heed it. What are the only ways of inquiry that lead to knowledge? He's going to talk about two ways here. The one way, assuming that being is, and that it is impossible for it not to be, is a trustworthy path for truth attends it. So that's a good way to think about the universe. The bad way, the other, that not being is, and that it necessarily is, 
I call a wholly incredible, he's using incredible in a derogatory way there, incredible as in not credible. So the other, that not being is and that it necessarily is, I call a wholly incredible course, since thou canst not recognize not being, for this is impossible, nor couldst thou speak of it, for thought and being are the same thing. So there's his first line in his poem on concerning truth. So breaking that up a little bit, what's he saying? He's saying that there's two ways of inquiry. First, assuming that being is, and that's impossible for it not to be. That's a good one. That's one he's going to say you can use. The other, that not being is, and that it necessarily is. That one he's going to call a bunch of nonsense. You can't say that not being is. He's going to call that a contradiction, and that's going to be the contradiction he derives over and over again. So you can't not recognize, speak about, or even think about not being. And thought and being are the same thing. So he's going to make an argument here that might not be that intuitive to us, but he's going to actually argue that thought and being are one and the same, and so we'll be more comfortable with that once we cover that part of the argument. It is necessary both to say and think that being is, for it's possible that being is, but it is impossible that not being is. So if you think about that backwards, let's start with this. It is impossible that not being is, which leaves us left to think that being is. And restraint, he goes on to tell, uh, well, the goddess is telling him, restrain yourself from thinking that things which are not are. Now remember that this is attacking Heraclitus. Heraclitus, when you have a change, you have something, you have what is becoming what it isn't, and what isn't becoming what it is. You have something both is and is not, what it was and was not, right? Remember the caterpillar Tim? So I got my caterpillar Tim, and he turns into a butterfly. Do I still have the same thing I started with? Or did I get rid of Tim and go find a butterfly? No, I still have Tim. I still have the same thing. But do I have the same thing that I started with? No. I had a caterpillar. Now I have a butterfly. I both do and do not have what I started with. It both is and is not what I started with. That's what he is arguing against here. So he is 100% arguing against the Heracletian view that you can have that... You can have things that are not also are. Okay, so we got that being is, but it remains to show that... No, we already got that being is. Sorry, I wrote that wrong. It remains to show that being is without beginning and end, that it is universal, existing alone, immovable, and eternal. So we'll prove each of these with his poem. Uh, before he goes on to the proof, just decided to throw this in here because it was funny. Uh... Here's what he says about those following the second wave of inquiry, basically about the Heracletians. <clears throat> and from that course also, along which mortals knowing nothing wander aimlessly, since helplessness directs the roaming thought in their bosom, and they are born on death and likewise blind, amazed, amazed there's been in a derogatory way as well, born on death and likewise blind, amazed, headstrong races, they who consider being and not being as the same and not the same and that all things follow a back-turning course. So, you can see how he's referencing the Heraclitians there, the Heracletians. Okay, so let's get to our first little proof now. Proof that being is eternal and absolute. Absolute meaning it's not changing. Uh, in reference to being, for what generating of it wilt thou seek out? From what did it grow, and how? I will not permit thee to say or to think that it came from not being, for it is impossible to think or to say that not being is. What thing would then have stirred it into activity that should arise from not being later rather than earlier? So it is necessary that being either is absolutely or is not, nor will the force of the argument permit that anything spring from being except being itself. Therefore, justice does not slacken her fetters to permit generation or destruction, but holds being firm. Notice that they use generation and destruction to describe change in general. So let's break that one down. Okay. In short, what's he arguing here? If being had a beginning, what did it come from? There wasn't being if it had a beginning, so what did it come from? It had to come from not being. But you can't say it came from not being, for that would imply not being is. Contradiction. So if being had a beginning, that would imply not being is. Contradiction. Therefore, being did not have a beginning. Same argument again here. If being comes to an end, 
What is there? All being comes to an end, what's left? Well, if it's not being, then it's not being, right? But you can't say not being, for that would imply not being is. Contradiction. Therefore, um, the universe doesn't come to an end. So the universe is eternal, but is there change inside the universe? Now, he's arguing against generation and destruction is his way of arguing against change in general. And uh, I just already talked about the butterfly, but we can follow this example. Consider a seed growing into a flower. In the beginning, you have a seed and not a flower, and in the end, you have a flower and not a seed. You have what is becoming what is not, and what is not becoming what is. That leads to being, that leads to not being becoming. That leads to not being existing. When I'm holding a little flower seed, the not being reference there is the flower. Is it a flower? No. So does the flower exist? No. So the flower is not being. But then we have the flower later. So now not being is. That's how he's saying that uh, generation and destruction, or change in general, all change can be described in terms of generation and destruction. That's how they're going to argue that change implies a contradiction. The exact same way that Heraclitus did. Any confusion there? What's the confusion? I don't see how he's proving that the universe is eternal. No, here's where we got the universe is eternal. It doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end. So it's eternal. Okay. Here's where he's arguing and there's no internal change. Because internal change implies a contradiction. That there's no change? That there's no change, yes. That's ultimately what it's going to say. Okay. So here we get, so there's no change in the universe because change implies that it both is and is not what it was and was not, right? Tim, turning into the butterfly. Yeah. Well, how, how does he explain a seed growing into a flower if it's not changed? That isn't, oh, your senses deceive you. He's not going to make any reference to his senses here. He's only going to appeal to reason. 100% appealing to reason is how he's going to make these arguments. And then the second part of his poem is where he now wants to talk about natural phenomena that we come across. He wants to give his opinions on both, so that's why he splits up the poem and he recognizes that the second ones are just opinion, but he still wants to give them. So that's why he has this poem split. So yeah, he'd say your senses deceive you into thinking that flowers grow. He'd say the whole universe is a big planum sphere just full of unmoving stuff. Completely solid. No way to differentiate this part of the universe from this part of the universe. And everything you think you experience, you don't really experience. It's just a big illusion. Change is illusion. There's no real change. And Jeremy's going to tell us why there's no real change. <laughs> All right. Anyways, okay. So it is necessary that being either is absolutely or is not, but for being to not be is impossible, so being is absolutely. It's eternal, it has no beginning, it has no end, and there's no internal change. So it's absolute. Never changing, consistent, always the same, being, everything, the whole universe, being. Good? Good? Yeah, okay. Okay, here's an interesting one. Proof that being is continuous. Now, for those of you from math, we're not using continuous in that sense. Here we mean continuous uh, the way that this line is continuous. There's no holes in it. That's a continuous line. That's a not continuous line. That's how we mean it. Okay, so he's going to prove that being is continuous. Uh, real quick, this word contiguous just means next to. Arizona is contiguous to Utah. It still doesn't have an end or a beginning. Yeah. Uh, in time, eternal. It doesn't have a beginning or an ending in time. He thinks that the universe is limited in size, as a finite size, but it's eternal in time. So the universe is like a metal sphere that just sits there forever, never changing. But like in its physicality, it has like a beginning and end. Yes, it's like a sphere. The same way that you can say that a sphere is bounded in some sense. 
I mean, I don't know what you want to call the beginning of the sphere and the end of the sphere, but the point is, it's definitely bounded, it's definitely finite, there's only so much of it. So the entire universe for him is just... A, being, being continuous does have some sort of reason. It just means that there's no gaps in being. Okay. You can't have being over here and being over here. That's impossible. Being is continuous. Right? The same way that if I want a line, this line is continuous, this line isn't continuous because there's a gap. Okay. There's no gap in being. That's what he's saying. So it doesn't have to be line. infinite. Huh? So you're saying that everything's just one? Everything's just one. Yes. You got it. You're jumping ahead. That's exactly what he says. <laughs> everything is just one solid ball of stuff. Perfectly distributed stuff. Okay, so I'll prove that being is continuous. Nor is it subject to division, for it is all alike, nor is anything more in it, so as to prevent its cohesion, nor anything less, but all is full of being, therefore all is continuous, for being is contiguous to being. So being is not subject to division, for then you would have not being between being. So look, if I have some being here and some being here, and I'm saying, okay, and there's not being between them, so now it's not continuous, then what's between them? I told you it's not being between them, so it's not being between them, right? So that means that there's not being right there. You see it? We can't have not being. <laughs> that doesn't work. So there can't be not being between them. So being is contiguous to being. So all being is continuous. Does that argument make sense? I think so. It is weird. But let's make sure it makes sense because this kind of talk we got to get comfortable with before we get to Zeno. Because <laughs> this is the exact type of talk he's going to so say. So he's basically saying that because not being can't exist, right. then it can't be there. Right. So if we try to put being, if we try to separate being, so we have two pieces of being that aren't touching, right? Yeah. Now they're separate. So if they're separate, if they're not touching, what does that mean? That there's no being between them. Yeah. That there's not being between them. That there is not being right there between them. So not being is. Uh-oh. Can't have that. It's impossible for not being to be. You this can't is have not being. On reason. Yeah, he is. <laughs> well. <laughs> He sure thinks so. Right. Yes. He is just following reason methodically. Wherever it takes him, he's going to go. And if it leads to all this, so be it. And if that's not the way the world looks to us, well, that's so much worse for the world around us. This is the way it really is, obviously. Follow the reason. What you more sure of? 1 plus 1 equals 2 or that there's a tree outside? If you're going to stick with the 1 plus 1 equals 2... Then you see where Parmenides is coming from. Uh, any more questions about this argument before we move to the next one? No? Okay. All right. Uh, proof that being is unmoved. Uh, this one's an easy proof, but he has a lot of poetical language in there. Further, it is unmoved in the holding of great chains without beginning or end, since generation and destruction have completely disappeared, and true belief has rejected them. So generation and destruction, we proved that there's no change, which is what he means by any time he says generation and destruction. So we got rid of generation and destruction. So true belief has rejected them. It lies the same, abiding in the same state and by itself. Accordingly, it abides fixed in the same spot, for powerful necessity holds it in confining bonds, which restrain it on all sides. Sounds exactly like your mathematical proofs, right? <laughs> in short, what's he saying? Since being is absolute, it cannot change, suffer generation or destruction. Not sure why I put a question mark there. Therefore, since motion is a change, being is motionless. So we got rid of change. Motion is just a change. Yeah. Simple argument, but he dresses it up a lot in his uh, powerful necessity language. All right. Proof that being and thought are one. Okay, this one's the interesting one, and it follows this exact same thought over there. 
For thou canst not separate being in one place from contact with being in another place. Being's continuous. It is not scattered here and there through the universe. Can't have this picture down here. Nor is it compounded of parts. Uh, well, we'll just keep going. Therefore, thinking and that by reason of which thought exists are one and the same thing. For thou wilt not find thinking without being from which it receives its name. Okay, so what's he saying here? You can't separate thinking from what you're thinking about. Right? All thinking has to be about being. You can't have thought about non-being, right? We went over that first thing. So all thought has to be about being. And since you cannot think about non-being, nothing, you must be thinking about being. So all thought is about being. And since being cannot be separated, thought and being are one. You can't have your thought about being here and being over here. Because then what's between them? Not, Not being. But being is continuous. It looks like this. So since being is continuous, then your thought about being and being itself are the same thing. Because you can't have a thought about not being, so your thought's about being. And being's continuous. So it, your thought has to be connected with everything, all other being. So all being's continuous. You can't have some being here and some being here. You follow that argument? It's a weird one, but that's how he gets that your thought and being are the same thing. Uh, final comments on the way of opinion. Remember the way of opinion is a bad way. Wherefore, all, thing, all these things will be but a name. All these things which mortals determined in the belief that they were true, namely that things arise and perish, change, that they are and are not, that they change their position and vary in color. So, all that is just talk, in other words. Now, before he goes on to the way of opinion, right at the very end, he mentions that the universe is like a sphere. So that's where we found out that he thinks, what he thinks is the shape of the universe. Kind of. We'll read it and then talk. But since there is a final limit, it is perfected on every side, like the mass of a rounded sphere, equally distant from the center at every point. For it is necessary that it should neither be greater at all nor less anywhere, since there is no not being which can prevent it from arriving at equality, nor is being such that there may ever be more than what is in one part and less in another, since the whole is invalid. For if it is equal on all sides, it abides in equality within its limits. Now, big mess of words there. Most people interpret that as he's saying the universe is a spherical plane. Evenly distributed mass, perfectly distributed, no little gaps, no holes anywhere. Just spherical plane. Good? Yeah. Okay. Now, just wanted to do a quick throwback to this list here. Remember our Pythagorean opposites. Now, notice the properties that Parmenides' being has. One, it's limited. It's odd because it's one. Everything's combined in one. It's at rest. And that's pretty much what applies. But you'll notice that he's only taking from this column over here when he's talking about being. Yeah. So. That's a little throwback to some of his more Pythagorean uh, yeah, side. Okay, and then the poem continues on to now concerning opinion. At this point, I cease from trustworthy discourse and the thought about truth. From here on, learn the opinions, learn the opinions of mortals, hearing all the elusive order of my verses. Men have determined in their minds to name two principles, but one of these they ought not to name. The two principles are two ways of doing inquiry. And in so doing, they have erred. They distinguish them as antithetic in character and give them each character and attributes distinct from those of the other. So the one way concerning truth, and then this one's talking about the way concerning opinion as he goes on. So that's how he introduces it. And then from here on out, he goes into a pretty elaborate cosmology, which we won't bother covering because 
From here on out, nobody cares what part Mandy says in this part of the poem. It's going to be the first part of the poem that has such big impacts. So the big problem that we run into here with Parmenides is Parmenides versus Heraclitus. We've got a problem now. So Parmenides is saying what is, is, what is not, is not, and what is not can neither be nor be thought about. Heraclitus says what is, is things that are, are not, and things that are, not, are, nothing ever is. Read that two ways. Nothing ever is, everything is becoming, but nothing, not being, ever is. It is consistently existing, not to be, nothing. There are no entities. Nothing ever is. Everything is becoming. There's no being out there. There's only becoming. So people are kind of stuck in this weird dilemma. Heraclitus says there is change in the universe, but that implies a contradiction. Parmenides says, no, 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 you can't have contradictions. So there's no change. So he's getting rid of change. So they both agree that change implies a contradiction, however, come to opposite conclusions. Heraclitus says change is obvious, and so contradictions must exist. Parmenides says the law of contradiction is obvious, and so change must be an illusion. You see the problem that philosophy is in now? Yeah. Because this is going to be reconciling these two, is what a lot of later philosophers are going to do after we get the rest of Parmenides' followers. Uh, and they both seem to agree that the senses deceive us. So what does Parmenides say? Parmenides claims that there is only the motionless, changeless, undifferentiated ball of being, but that, uh, but that is not the way that it appears to our senses. We see change all the time. We watch flowers grow. There's you, there's me, there's separate entities. There's all sorts of stuff that doesn't look like just one big solid sphere. Heraclitus claims that the world is in a constant flux. Everything is changing in every respect at every time, but that is not the way the world appears to our senses. This marker is still just this marker, still just this marker, right? Heraclitus says, oh, what preserves it? What makes it look like it's not changing? There's just as much water flowing into the marker as there is flowing out, and so the marker looks like it's consistently staying there. So both of them are arguing that your senses are um, invalid in some sense, and they both agree that change implies a contradiction, but they come down on opposite sides of this. So later philosophers, well, not who's right, but should have better said, later philosophers, after we cover the flaws of Parmenides, are going to be trying to reconcile these two. So how do we reconcile these two is the question I should have put there. So that's the end of Parmenides. Any questions on Parmenides before we continue? Anything we need to recap? So these are two completely different schools of thought. Uh, he was Ion Heraclitus was Ionian. Uh huh. And this is Italian. Uh huh. Parmenides. Mm -hmm. Heraclitus was from Ephesus. Uh, he didn't really have any followers that we've covered. Uh, a lot of people view him as starting the school of the skeptics. So uh, you might remember one of his followers, Cratylus, became a complete skeptic. He was the one that said there's no entities, and since all words need a referent, words are completely meaningless because there's no entities for them to reference. So he stopped talking on principle. And whenever he was hungry, he wagged his finger. His servants would bring him food. Guess something stays the same. So yeah. Wagging your fingers still Why do we value their opinions about these things? <laughs> uh, so the reason that these two are of interest is because uh, philosophy is going to take a turn trying to reconcile these two. That, that's the next big question. So the first big question is, what's the fundamental stuff of the universe? So we're still trying to answer that question. And now at the same time, the next big question that people are going to be, the next thing people are going to try to uh, encapsulate into their philosophy as they try to give the one stuff or the explanation for what the universe is composed of, is now they need to make sure that they can include change in their system without violating Parmenides, without it leading to contradiction, but they still need change. So they're going to try and get their change, but get their change without it violating Parmenides. So, so we're going to use reason to acknowledge change, in a sense. Uh, 
Because Parmenides was about reason. There's different ways of doing it. Uh, so, throughout philosophy, there's roughly two schools when it comes to this type of thinking. There's the rationalists and the empiricists. And that's a rough way of splitting it up. The rationalists say, follow your reason wherever it goes. And if the world around you seems to violate that, so much worse for the world around you. The empiricists say, no, all knowledge starts in sense perceptions. That's where all knowledge ultimately comes from. It comes from your senses. And so you have to rely on your senses to ultimately get your knowledge. And then it goes where it goes from there. So the dichotomy becomes much bigger when we get to uh, the, the Renaissance. We're going to see that the English are empiricists and the French are rationalists. But this so is by point. contrast, today, how would we... There is people on every side of this issue today. So you might hear some of these and think that these are absurd positions, but well, there everything are... Everything based on reason sounds like science today. Today's modern concept. Uh, the rationalists... <laughs> yeah, it's worse than that. <laughs> the scientists now have kind of said, we're done with philosophy, and we're just going to continue on our merry way. And so if you were to ask a scientist his philosophical views, they might run completely contrary to how he actually does a science. And so there isn't a consistency between their philosophical views and how they actually act because there's no effort on their part to make those two things coherent. So people in science today have pretty much given up on even keeping track of philosophy. They say it's turned into a bunch of nonsense, we're done. Uh, Richard Feynman summed up all philosophy with two letters, BS. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, you know, it turns into just a massive storm of a bunch of nonsense on a lot of sides. Because there's no doubt full-fledged terrifications that exist today who think, yeah, the law of contradiction doesn't hold. Which, it's pretty hard to have a consistent worldview like that. Now, these early people, they're still building up the foundations of logic. It's not until Aristotle that those are made explicit, so we can forgive Heraclitus, but once Aristotle explicitly states the rules of logic and demonstrates to you how it's physically impossible for you to not believe the law of contradiction, then you lose a lot more respect for a lot of modern philosophers. So, yeah, it's not uncommon that modern philosophers lose more and more respect as time goes on. <laughs> uh, any other questions about Parmenides, before we continue to... What was his one stuff? What was his one stuff? The undifferentiated being. It isn't one stuff that makes up everything. There's just one. <laughs> so we don't even need to talk about the different stuffs. There's just the one. And we'll see the pluralists come next after we finish the Italians, who go back to many stuffs, the different stuffs, and back to looking for the one stuff or the few things that make up the entire universe. Um, there isn't an outside of the sphere of the universe. The question doesn't make sense. So, because that would be not being. <laughs> yeah, that would be not being. But uh, that's kind of a detour. I don't know if this is working. I can give you the modern picture. Um, how we view our universe right now, the best area right now is it has positive curvature, so you can view the universe right now as the surface of a sphere, and I can go on a 10 minute detour onto that if you would like, okay. and explain it. Do you want that? Yeah. Okay, so we'll roughly go over Big Bang Theory. Um, the first way, the first intuition that you need to capture if we're going to do this is uh, the difference between three-dimensional and two-dimensional. So let's imagine that Bob is a completely two-dimensional being. Here's Bob. Here's Bill. Bill, Bob. Now, for Bob and Bill, they are two-dimensional beings. Their universe is completely contained in this whiteboard. They have no concept of out of the whiteboard. They have no concept of into the whiteboard. They only know those directions. If Bob and Bill get into an argument, Bob can go into his room, and he can take his door and shut his door. Now, Bob's room does not have a floor. It doesn't have a ceiling. There's no concept of beneath Bob, there's no concept of above Bob. There's only to the right of Bob, to the left of Bob, in front of Bob, behind Bob. That's the only thing that makes sense of Bob's world. 
So now Bob's in his room, the door's shut. There is nowhere that Bill can go to see Bob. He's completely enclosed off from him. Now look at you as a three-dimensional being. You can see Bob, no problem, because there's empty space there. And any empty space in a two-dimensional universe, you can see just fine. Similarly, if there was a four-dimensional being looking down on us in our three dimensions of space, I'll ignore the dimension of time for this whole conversation, so I'll just say this is a three-dimensional universe. Uh, if a four-dimensional being were to look down on our three-dimensional universe, he can see inside this room, no problem. He can tell you the contents of your stomach. He can see right in it. That's not hard for him to do. The same way it's not hard for you to see inside Bob's room. You're saying, which direction is he looking? The one that you can't point. That's the direction he's looking. The same way that Bob can't point up. He can only point those directions. Right? Okay. So, we can't visualize, or at least I can't visualize, a four-dimensional universe. But I can't visualize three-dimensional shapes in a four-dimensional universe, but I can visualize two-dimensional shapes in a three-dimensional universe. That's pretty easy for our intuition. So that's how we're gonna think about this. And so the best way to think about our universe right now is think about it kind of like the surface of a sphere. So imagine now that our universe is actually two dimensions and we plot it on the surface of a sphere. That's our universe. Now, our universe then Think about the surface of, of the Earth as a good analogy. So here we are on the surface of the Earth, and imagine now we're two-dimensional, so we actually exist in its surface. And someone asks you a question like, okay, now go to the center of the surface of the Earth. Where is that? Where is the center of the surface of the Earth? There isn't a center to the sphere. There isn't a center to the surface of the Earth, but that's all the existence. So the way that we currently understand our universe is that it exists as a three-dimensional surface on a four-dimensional sphere. The surface of a four-dimensional sphere, that's what our universe is. Now, if we throw a bunch of laws of physics out the window, what does that mean? That means if I run that way for a long, long time in the universe, straight line, so I go off, off the Earth, through the moon, keep going that way forever and ever, I'll come back and end up right here. The same way that if I were to walk on the surface of the Earth, around the Earth, I come back to where I started. Another way to say that is, once again, throwing the laws of physics out in the universe. If I peep, poke my head out the window, I can see the back of my head if nothing was in my way all the way. Right? So the, surf, the universe we can view as a surface of a sphere. Now, a better way to view it is the surface of a balloon because our universe actually expands. So if I drew two dots on a balloon, imagine that this is the surface of the balloon. As we blow the balloon up, it gets bigger and bigger then those dots get further and further apart, right? And that's what's currently happening with our universe. So you view it as a surface of a, of a balloon. It's blowing up, it's getting bigger and bigger. And so distance is growing between us. We used to be like this, now we're like this. Now, the further apart we, away we are, the faster distance grows between us. So if we were standing really close like this, then as the balloon blew up, it might only look like that. But the further apart we are, the faster distance grows between us. So eventually the distance between us grows so fast that a photon can't even get from here to here. The distance is growing too fast, a photon can't even travel over there. So there will come a point where I can't even see you. So now some people like to think about, okay, there's a, this notion of the Big Bang where the Big Bang happened. To get intuition for the Big Bang, run it backwards. So imagine I got this balloon and now I run it backwards. And I'm shrinking the balloon, I'm shrinking the balloon, I'm shrinking the balloon, I'm shrinking the balloon, I'm shrinking the balloon down to a point. That's how the universe starts. So I take that point, it's an infinitely expandable little rubber balloon, I start blowing it up bigger, 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 that's the Big Bang. Where did the Big Bang happen? In that point. But which part of the universe? Did it happen right here? Um, or over here? Where on the surface of the balloon did the balloon start? everywhere, right? The entire surface was once a single point that started expanding. So that's the notion of the Big Bang. So if you view our universe that way, as the surface of a four-dimensional sphere, now, what's outside the universe? <laughs> Doesn't really make sense to talk about. So it just describes the curvature that the universe has. So it's possible, it makes perfect sense to talk about for those of you who took topology, that's just a three-dimensional manifold, right? That's how we would describe our universe. 
So you can talk completely about the shape of the universe and the curvature of the universe without making any reference to something outside the universe. Okay, that was a little detour. Any questions? Uh, all right, Zeno, did you want me to go first or did you want to go first? I would rather go first. All right, so you do Zeno of Elia. Yeah, Elia. I pronounced it wrong because I read it wrong throughout this whole essay. Okay, so Elia, right? Zeno of Elia. Zeno of Elia was an incredibly profound philosopher of the pre-Socratic era. Born around 490 BC, he is almost exclusively known for propounding several brilliant paradoxes. We don't have his writings. What we do know of him is taken from other philosophers, such as Simplicius or Aristotle. So while we don't have his exact treatise, we do have somewhat an understanding of what he did. His antinomies for things such as motion and place were entirely controversial to common ideas and beliefs at the time. He was able to make an absurd claim, such as motion is a paradox, and prove it using logic. Many view him as the founder of dialectic, as well as a profound influence on antilogic. There are many things about Zeno that, like most Socratic philosophers, we don't know about. Much of his life has faded away, his works are gone, and all we have of him are what survived throughout the passage of time throughout, through philosophers such as Aristotle. His purposes for his works, his antinomies of plurality, and his paradoxes of motion, however, remain. Zeno of Elia was the disciple of the philosopher Parmenides. Parmenides was a philosopher who believed in monism, a view that all is one, that reality is a single unitary whole lacking independent parts. This was a paradoxical way of thinking, and Parmenides was often mocked for it. Zeno was loyal to him, and most of his paradoxes were extremely analogous analogous to those of his master. In fact, Socrates had once accused Zeno of duplicating the works of Parmenides, only changing the composition while still propounding the same idea. In a way, this is quoting Plato from Socrates. In a way, he has written the same thing as you, but he's changed it around to try and fool us into thinking he's saying something different. For you say in the verses you've composed that all is one, and you do a fine and good job of providing proof of this. He, on the other hand, says that there are not many things, and he too provides numerous and powerful proofs. Given that one says one, and the other not many, and that each speaks in this way so as to appear to have said none of the same things, when you are in fact saying virtually the same thing, what you said, what you said seems said in a way that is beyond the powers of the rest of us. However, Zeno sees his works in a different light. Zeno replies to Socrates as such. The treatise is, in truth, a sort of a support for Parmenides' doctrine against those attempting to ridicule it on the ground that, if one is, the doctrine suffers many ridiculous consequences that contradict it. This treatise, therefore, argues against those who say the many are, and it pays them back with the same results and worse, intending to demonstrate that their hypothesis, if many are, suffers even more ridiculous consequences than the hypothesis of there being one if one pursues the issue sufficiently. Instead of straight out supporting what Parmenides was saying, Zeno instead took a different approach. He was mocking the mockers. While ideas such as those of Parmenides may have contradictions and things may get in the way of its truth, so do many of the things that are taken as set in stone truths, such as motion and plurality. These are the purposes of Zeno and his paradoxes. The antimonies of plurality are an important part of what we have left from Zeno. It was the way he argued against plurality, arguing for the case of monism, that all things are one. Plato has a record of such an encounter between Socrates and Zeno, where Zeno took the opportunity to propound his point. This takes place after Socrates hears Zeno talking in Athens for the first time. Once Socrates had heard it, he asked Zeno to read the first hypothesis in the first argument again. And, after it was read, he said, What do you mean by this, Zeno? If things that are, are many, that they must both be like and unlike. But this is impossible, for neither can unlike things be like, nor like things be unlike. Is this not what you say? Yes, said Zeno. Then if it is impossible both for things unlike to be like, and for like things to be unlike, then it is also impossible for there to be many things. 
for if there were many things, they would incur impossibilities. So this is what your arguments intend, nothing other than to maintain forcibly, contrary to everything normally said, that there are not many things. And do you think that each of your arguments is a proof of this very point, so that you consider yourself to be furnishing just as many proofs that there are not many things as the arguments you have written? Is this what you say, or do I not understand correctly? Not at all, said Zeno, but you have understood perfectly well what the treatise as a whole intends. And the, par the antimony of like and unlike things is one of his paradoxes and antimonies plurality. He also used other antimonies to further validate his point. The treatise aforementioned contained 40 arguments, although we have much fewer than that remaining known today. He also used the antimony of unlimited and limited to prove that there are not many things. For if there are many things, they must be both limited and unlimited, which is a contradiction and therefore impossible. So basically what... Zeno was saying with this is if there are many things there has to be exactly how many there are, no more, no less because there are many things but if there are many things so as to say there are two markers if I understand this correctly then in the space between the markers there can't be nothing there has to be something in between them which means there has to be another marker in between them and in between those there has to be another marker there always goes into, to the point that's so small there always is something in between at infinitum. For if there was nothing in between, what's the difference between these two markers? Nothing. There's no space in between. It's just the one marker, which would not mean there are many things. Therefore, many things are impossibility. Another one of Zeno's antimonies, plurality, is the antimony of large and small. This follows largely the same structure as his copious other arguments as described by Simplicius. One of these, Simplicius says, is the argument in which he demonstrates that if there are many things, they are both large and small. So large as to be unlimited in magnitude, and so small as to be to have no magnitude. Indeed, in this argument, he shows that what has neither magnitude nor thickness nor bulk would not even exist. It would have to have some sort of substance to exist. For if, he says, you were added to another entity, it would not make it any larger. For since it is, of, it is of no magnitude, when it is added, there cannot be any increase in magnitude. So you have something, and you add something else to it. If it doesn't get bigger or it doesn't get smaller, what you added to it is nothing. Is basically what it's saying. It has no magnitude. But if when it is taken away from the other thing, it would be no smaller, so if you subtracted from it, same idea. And again, when it is added to the other thing, it will not increase. It is clear that what is added and what is taken away was nothing, both large and small. These are the known antimonies of Zeno the Ilea. His school, his place. Zeno is, however, more prominent for his paradoxes of motion. These were the ways that Zeno was able to prove that motion, as we know it, is a logical fallibility. The most famous of all these is his Achilles and the tortoise paradox. In this paradox, he claims that no matter how fast a runner may be, if the slower runner has a head start, then the faster will never be able to pass him. And he uses the example of the slower being the tortoise and the faster being Achilles, who's pretty fast. So because Achilles is a gentleman, he lets the tortoise have a head start at the beginning of the race. So Achilles, this is his first position. He let the tortoise start out in this first other position. In order for Achilles to pass ahead of the tortoise, he must first reach the position where the tortoise once was. So by the time Achilles reaches where tortoise, the tortoise was the first time, then the tortoise moved just a little bit. And this can be shown as A2 equals T1 and T2 equals T1 plus D, D being the distance that the tortoise was able to travel. And once again, in order for Achilles to pass the tortoise, he must reach the position where the tortoise once was. And in order for him to do that, by the time he reaches that position, the tortoise has moved forward a little bit, following the same structure. I'm impressed with my handwriting right now. This is impressive. 
tortoise could move forward the same distance by the time Achilles, by the time Achilles reaches the tortoise. So this will go on forever. He will move forward, tortoise will move forward. He will reach the position tortoise was, tortoise will move forward at infinitum. It is impossible for Achilles to pass the tortoise. It'll start out with a distance of plus one. So the tortoise will be at position two. And then if he moves forward a little bit, it'd be two, point two, because it moved forward, point two. By the time he reaches it again, it'd be 2.22. Two, two. And again, 2.222. Two, two, two. So one of the other implications of this paradox is that the race will never be finished because Achilles can never pass the tortoise and the tortoise will never reach position, reach number three. So that's his first paradox of motion. Zeno created more paradoxes of motion, although all we have records of are two others, the stadium and the arrow. The stadium is also known as the dichotomy, di di dichotomy, that's the one. So, basically, in this one, He's saying that, I still don't understand why he called it the stadium, but that's what he did. So in order for an object to move from point A to point B, it will have to cross this line of motion. Before it can reach point B, it must reach the halfway check mark. Otherwise it can't reach point B, you have to go to half before you can get to one. In order, before you can reach the half mark, it'll have to pass the quarter mark because you can't reach the half mark until you pass the quarter mark. Before it can reach the quarter mark, it'll have to pass the eighth mark because you can't reach the quarter unless you pass the eighth. In order to reach the eighth, it'll have to pass the sixteenth and this will go on forever. So you will have an infinite amount of checkpoints in this limited amount of area. And it's common sense that you can't pass an unlimited amount of spaces in a limited amount of time. It's impossible. You'd be, it'd be infinity. It's a controversy. Therefore, motion in and of itself is impossible. And for Zeno's arrow paradox of motion, he's saying that if you fire an arrow into the air, and you're going for the target, you take any instance in time in which the arrow is flying towards the target. The arrow is either where it is or where it is not. In that instance of time, the arrow is not moving. So the process of the arrow coming from point A to point B, it's basically going from instance to instance to instance. It's not moving. It's going from solid to solid to solid to solid until it hits the target. That's his error paradox of motion. Doesn't that contradict the stadium paradox? Yeah, because it gets to the point. It does get to the point. And the stadium paradox says before you get to the halfway mark, or before you get to the end, you have to get to the halfway mark. But before you get to the halfway mark, you have to get to the one quarter mark. Before you get to the one quarter mark, you have to get to the one eighth mark, etc. Hey, so I you can't start. Well, he's basically saying this is two different ways you can say it can't move. If he said it was able to move in the stadium, then it would controverse, but he says this can't move, that can't move, justifying the same claim. Right. Is what he's going for. Think. We'll read over all these and we'll go into more depth. I don't want yeah. to just throw him off. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so those are basically all the known works of his paradox of motion that we have. His treatise actually contained 40. Zeno of Elia had some incredible paradoxes. He was able to look into a general belief and find a contradiction in there to argue against it, even if it doesn't make common sense. While today there are philosophers such as Aristotle who have given some ideas with the intent to disprove what Zeno was propounding, such as the fact that time is not made up of certain instances or moments in time, contrary to what Zeno's motion paradox is used as a basis, his antinomies and paradoxes still have a certain provocative challenge 
designed to be a dichotomy to our common sense view of our world and its inner workings. While responses to his paradoxes often require many advanced mathematical techniques, his actual paradoxes themselves do not have any necessarily complicated mathematics, and some of them, none at all, only logical thinking. It was remarkable what he's done. His antinomies of plurality and his paradox of motion, which he was able to form into viable arguments, are what sets him above the rest. And I have a quote from John Palmer. Thus, George Kerford has argued both the patronage of Pericles and has keen interest in the intellectual developments of his day must have been critically important to the sophistic movement and that Zeno's paradoxes were a profound influence on the development of the sophist method of antilogic, which he sees as perhaps the most characteristic feature of the thought in the whole period. And that is Zeno of Elia. So that last little bit he was talking about, uh, how it's contributing to, contributing to the sophists. The sophists are renounced for saying that there's no objective truth. And they're going to use the absurdity of, we see change around us, at the same time Zeno proves that there's no motion. So there is no truth. That's why he's referencing those sophists. So fortunately, I think every paradox he went over, I also go over. So we can go into depth how you want on each of them. When we get to it. If you have a question about a particular paradox, wait till we come to that paradox. But if you just have a question, feel free to ask. Well, I forgot about the paradox, but what was Socrates' uh, what was Socrates doing to Zeno? Like, what was he pointing out that was wrong, and what was Zeno saying? What, oh, what, so, what was his reply? So, first off, uh, that little story he's talking about. So that comes from a dialogue of Plato's called the Parmenides. And so what this dialogue is, it's when Plato... So Parmenides visits Athens. Parmenides wasn't from Athens, but he visits Athens, and he brings Zeno with him. Uh, Zeno and Parmenides, they were lovers when Zeno was younger, and then Parmenides adopted him as a son. So they're very close together. And he talked about the story, how Zeno... Well, I'll just read over the story, I guess. Anyways, so Zeno has his book, his 40 Arguments, showing that things like motion is impossible. Socrates says, Zeno, you didn't say anything different than your master, Parmenides. Zeno says, I know, that wasn't the point. The point was, people kept making fun of Parmenides because his arguments lead to absurd conclusions. So he was trying to show, saying the opposite of Parmenides leads to even more absurd conclusions. So he was trying to make fun of the people making fun of his master. That's what he was doing with his book. So that's what his book was intended to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can read the Parmenides, uh, it has a lot to do with uh, Plato's theory of the forms, so if you don't already know that, you might miss a lot of the value of the dialogue, but it does talk about Parmenides and Zeno, so there is that value in it. But Any other questions? Yeah, cover what you were after? Wonderful. Okay, so Zeno. Zeno was a Pythagorean and became a follower of Parmenides. Aristotle calls him the, fire, the father of the dialectic method, arguing to discover truth. Uh, in particular, he supports Parmenides' position that motion and multiplicity are an illusion, and you'll see his paradoxes. And we already covered this exact story, that why he wrote these paradoxes, and still have nine of them extant to some degree. Some of them are missing portions, but there's roughly nine of these paradoxes existing. Okay, so the first one that not the first one we talked about. One of the ones he talked about was a dichotomy paradox. So here's how we have it captured. How is that pronounced? Antalanta? Suppose Antalanta, she's a Greek heroine, uh, wishes to walk to the end of a path. Before she can get there, she must get halfway there. Before she can get halfway there, she must get a quarter of the way there. Before traveling a quarter of the way there, she must get one-eighth of the way there. Before one-eighth, she must go one-sixteenth, and so on. So... Remember this one? So, the dichotomy paradox. So, uh, Zeno argues this leads to two contradictions, and there's two problems with this, and we'll see why. Well, then to cross the path, she must first traverse. Well, let's just read it. Then to cross the path, she must traverse an infinite number of distances in a finite number of time. If I'm going to walk from point A to point B, that's a finite distance, right? I need to do that in a finite number of times, sorry. In order to cross the distance, I need to take a finite time to do it. If it takes me an infinite amount of time to cross the distance, I never cross the distance. So you can show it's impossible for me to get from point A to point B. In order for me to get from point A to point B, I have to cross an infinite number of distances. 
And if you add up an infinite num amount of numbers, no matter how small, it's still infinite, right? So it's an infinite distance. Now, for those of you who've done calculus, you see how limits take care of all of this like that. Make a side note, there are modern philosophers who think that these paradoxes still hold. They absolutely do not. Wait, limits? How do limits do that? That's what taking a limit. Taking a limit is what you need to do over and over again to come up with the solution to this. Over here, what is he essentially arguing? He's saying, look, you can't get from point A to point B because you have to go half the distance, and you have to go a fourth the distance, and you have to go an eighth the distance, and you have to go a sixteenth the distance. Well, think about it backwards. Well, think about going from point A to point B. Well, you gotta go half that distance, and then half of that distance, and then half of that distance. So this is half the distance, and a fourth the distance, and an eighth, then you gotta go a sixteenth, then a thirty-second, then a sixty-fourth, etc. So adding all these up, dot, 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 he's saying, when you add all this up, what do you get? Infinity, because you're adding up an infinite amount of numbers. And no matter how small they are, infinite numbers, when you add up an infinite amount of numbers, doesn't matter how small they are, you still get infinity, right? No, 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 you don't. What does this converge to? Oh, it converges to the A. It converges to one. Yeah. We can take the limit of that sequence and we get one, and it's exactly one. It's not infinite, so okay. it doesn't hold. And we have rigorous mathematics for describing this. Uh, he called it advanced mathematics. It's really not that advanced, it's just dense. Starting with the axioms on the real numbers, what does it take? Probably five weeks of lectures before we can start yeah. proving these. So, all these are solved. Any modern philosophers still pretending like these paradoxes hold any weight are fooling themselves. So, no, these are solved. None of them are valid. They all have to do with misunderstanding how you take a limit. We now know how to take limits. It turns out motion is possible in our universe. Shocker. Big giveaway. Wow. <laughs> That's good to know. Anyways, but we'll try to understand the logic that he was using. So, then to cross a path, she must traverse an infinite number of distances in a finite time. But an infinite number of distances, no matter how small, is still infinite. Add up an infinite number of small numbers, you still add up an infinite amount of numbers that each contribute a little bit, you eventually get infinity. Isn't true, but that's his argument. And so she must cross an infinite distance in a finite time, impossible. So that's this contradiction. Furthermore, she can't even get started because there isn't the first distance that she can travel. What's the first distance that she can go? Before she can go one billionth of an inch, she has to go one half a billionth of an inch. And etc. you can do smaller, smaller, smaller. There's no limit to how small an increment you can talk about, right? So again, she can't get from point A to point B because that would be doing an infinite amount of distance at a finite time. Furthermore, she can't even get started walking because there isn't a first distance for her to traverse. So that's the two problems that he comes up with. With that one, therefore, motion is impossible. And then Achilles and the tortoise, he went over this one. I think you pretty much understood this one. Go over it, yay or nay. Hold up your hand if you want to go over it. Okay, if he wants to go over it, we'll do it. Okay, Achilles and the tortoise paradox. Here's the actual word. In a race, the quickest runner can never overtake the slowest, since the pursuer must first reach the point whence the pursued started, so that the slower must always hold a lead. Bad language, but that's how it's captured today. Anyways, we typically call it now the tortoise, the Achilles and the tortoise paradox, exactly what it says. Here's Achilles, he's the greatest athlete that the Greeks could think of, and a tortoise, a really, really slow animal. Achilles, being a gentleman, lets the tortoise have a head start, and the race is on. Well, by the time Achilles gets to where the tortoise is, the tortoise, no matter how slow, still is able to go a little distance. And by the time Achilles gets to that little distance, well, the tortoise, no matter how slow, still could have gone another little distance, etc. So Achilles was never able to catch up to the tortoise. The tortoise is always ahead. Achilles can never overtake the tortoise. Right? Okay, so we can't overtake the tortoise. Uh, and then the arrow paradox. Yay or nay? Yay. Yay? yay. No. So we'll do the, uh, yeah, this one was kind of weird, actually. This is probably the weirdest out of them, so let's do it for sure. If everything that occupies an equal space is at rest at that instant of time, and if that which is in locomotion is always occupying such a space at any moment, the flying arrow is therefore motionless at that instant of time and at the next instant of time. 
But if both instances of time are taken as the same instant or contiguous instances of time, would be a better way to say that. Sorry, this is the actual verbiage. Who cares what the actual verbiage is? You can read that. I'll re explain it so that it makes more sense. Okay, we've got. I pop that query in there. Oops. They're up here. Ah, oh, thanks. Okay, so we've got an arrow at an instant of time. So here's the arrow flying through the air. And we've got it captured at one instant of time, and it occupies this exact distance right there, right? Now, at a single instant of time, how far does the arrow move in a single instant of time? That distance. How far does it move in one instant of time? In a single instant, it doesn't. It doesn't. At a single instant of time, if I'm throwing this through the air, at a single instant, it's right here. How fast, or how much does it move in this instant of time if it's right here at this instant of time? It doesn't. So in this instant of time, so we'll plot this instant of time right here. Here's our timeline. So at this instant of time, here's what the arrow looks like. It doesn't move. Now look at the very next instant of time. Since it didn't move going from this instant to this instant, it must still be there. And now go to the next instant, and it must still be there. Now, those of you with a little calculus, you know you can't talk about the point next to a point. That's where this one breaks down, comes from taking limits again. There is no point next to a single point. It's like saying, what's the number that comes right after zero? Give me the number right after zero. You might be tempted at first to have said one. Well, what about one half? Okay, there goes one. What's the number that comes right after zero? There isn't one. We can even do a quick proof that there isn't one. Let's do a quick proof that there isn't one. Let x be the number right after zero. All right, so x is the number right after zero. Now we mean the positive number right after zero, right? Two. Then zero is less than x over two is less than x. Half of x is a number between zero and x. But x was a number right after zero. We just found a number in between zero and x. Contradiction. Therefore, there is no number right after x. Make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so flying arrow one now makes sense? Yeah. Anyone need more explanation? Okay. Let's do another one. I have a question that just general. Why, so these philosophers, are they just taking, they're not really trying to explain the world, are they? Yes, they are. But they aren't. <laughs> <laughs> they are saying that your senses mislead you. Look. Imagine a kid. If your senses are all you imagine have. a kid comes to you with some water, and they pour it on the desk. They say, "Leah, watch. I can make the water disappear." And then they hold their hands over it while the spot slowly evaporates, and it goes away. And they say, "See?" And you try to explain to them, "No, there's processes happening, but your senses just can't pick up on them." And there was slow evaporation happening so slowly that you can't pick up on it. And so you're explaining it in terms of things that you can't quite see. They can't see little water popping off of that. How are you going to explain evaporation to them? Well, how do we explain stuff to you all the time? I tell you that the reason you can see me is because a photon came off that light, hit my skin, bounced off, and went into your eye. Have you ever seen that photon? No. <laughs> you believed me. So I'm explaining how this physical phenomena happens all the time in reference to things that you have no direct experience of. And I might even tell you that you don't really see me, you see the photons. But your common sense experience is you see me. Obviously, our modern science makes a lot more sense than the arguments these guys are putting forth. This is the first time these types of arguments like, are coming up. getting from point A to B. Saying that you can never get that doesn't make sense. Okay, here's another one that you heard all the time as a little kid. Uh, your hands hit, oh, they're not really touching. How much does that divide common sense experience? If these two aren't touching, then what is? Well, if you were to zoom in really, really close, and actually, they're not really touching. And you did that all the time, right? You poked, wiring, you said not touching you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So this, this throwing our common sense out the window to rely on more sure models is something we do all the time. If you take physics from me, I'll do this to you left and right. 
I'll get you to talk about a physical phenomena that you've seen 1,000 times and get you to claim that it's A, and I'll show you, nope, it's B. And we'll do that tons of times. There's tons of phenomena that we can talk about. Well, we won't get into it. That's physics. <laughs> Anyways. So, yes, they very much think they're explaining the world. They're not intentionally making mistakes. They really didn't know how to deal with these paradoxes. This was really a holdup for them. And Aristotle was the first one to start whacking away at a few of them. Now, he didn't have our modern notions of mathematics, but he even started picking up on... Uh, he even understood that some of your problems are talking about the arrow. If you're talking about time, it's always these discrete instances where you can talk about one next to the other, and you're pretending that distances are continuous. But if you view them both as continuous, then your whole paradox goes out the window. And so Aristotle starts working away at these things, and you can read the way that he works away at them without having our notion of mathematics. Now, it's not very rigorous, but with our modern mathematics, we can clear out all these. But our modern mathematics was not developed to the point where we could until... I don't know, but within the past two, maybe 300 years before we could completely do away with these paradoxes. So they were real problems that intellectuals were struggling to wrap their head around and try to make sense out of how these things could be. Uh, we didn't do this one, did we? No. Denseness paradox. We want to do it? Yay or nay? Yes. Yay? All right. Oh, yeah. This one is a weird one. There's a very Parmenidean argument here. If there are many, there must be as many as there are, and neither more nor less than that. But if they are as many as they are, they would be limited. If there are many, things that are unlimited, they would be limited. If there are many, things that are, are unlimited. I didn't read another R. For there always are other, others, between the things that are, and again, others between those. And so the things that are, are unlimited. Okay, that's his argument, and then we'll make sense of it. Okay, so what's he saying here? If there are many things, then there has to be as many things as there are, some definite number of things, right? Like 10, 100, 1,000. However many you're saying there are, okay, fine, let's assume that there's that many, some definite number of things. However, between any two of those things, what are you going to say is between them? If you say that there's nothing between two things, how can you call them two things? Isn't that exactly what it means for something to be one thing? If there's nothing between them, then there, it's one thing. Right. So if you're going to say that there are two things, that they're separate things, then there has to be something between them. So between any two things, there exists another thing. Now these are two things. We say that those are two things, two separate things. There can't be nothing between them, otherwise they'd be the same thing, so there must be something between them, some other thing. And you can do that infinitum. So now there's an infinite number of things or an indefinite number of things. Contradiction. So assuming that there's many leads to contradiction, therefore there's not many, therefore there's just the one. Right? Any questions on that one? Good. And then... Finite size paradox. This is a fun one. He shows how assuming that there's many leads to the universe being both infinitely big and having no size at all. Now, we're missing some of it, and so I figured we'll just throw the paradox out the window and I'll just explain it to you without giving you the actual verbiage. You can look up what we have if you want. Okay, so here's how this argument goes. Assume that the universe is a whole composed of parts and consider what the size of the universe must be. So we're assuming that the universe isn't just one, but it has actual distinct separate parts. And we're going to show that this leads to the, contradic this leads to the universe being infinitely big and having no size at all. That's going to be the contradiction. So if parts exist, they must have some magnitude. They must have some size to them. If we're talking about a part without any size, we're not talking about a part, right? So if parts exist, they must have some magnitude to them. Every magnitude is theoretically divisible without limit. Right? If I take a, a, any magnitude, any definite size thing, I can split that in half, split the half in half, split that half in half, split that half in half, and I can keep dividing it without end. That's what you mean to. So every magnitude is theoretically divisible without limit, and so if the universe has parts, it must have an infinite number of parts. Make sense? 
then since the universe has infinite parts, it must be infinite in size. No matter how small those parts are, if you add up an infinite number of little parts, it doesn't matter, you still get infinitely big. See the argument there? Furthermore, however, consider the fundamental parts of the universe. A second. However, consider the fundamental parts that the universe would be composed of. Since they are its fundamental components, they must not be divisible. They must be indivisible into further parts, or they must not be divisible. Right? It's fundamental component parts. They must be, it's fundamental components means you can't break into smaller components. How big are its fundamental parts going to be if I can't divide it anymore? If they had any magnitude, I could divide it. So if I can't divide it, what must its magnitude be? None. Zero. So now we got a universe where its fundamental components have size zero. So we have a whole composed of a bunch of parts, each of size zero. Add up as many zeros as you want, and what do you get? Zero. zero. So the universe has no size. So the universe is infinitely big, and the universe has no size at all. Therefore, there are no parts to the universe. It is a one, whole, planum, completely solid being. That one makes sense? Yeah. You know what I mean by sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lots of, uh, okay, so that's the end of Zeno. Should have put in a little bit more about his life because he actually has a pretty interesting end. So Zeno, he lives in Elia. Eventually, later in his life, a tyrant comes to power in Elia, and he tries to overthrow the tyrant to uh, restore the previous government. I'm not sure if it was a democracy, but Zeno I think it was. Tried to? Yeah, oh. with a bunch of followers. There were a bunch of co-conspirators. They're trying to overthrow the tyrant. Anyways, the tyrant finds out about Zeno in particular, so he captures Zeno, starts torturing him to get information about the other people involved in overthrowing him. And Zeno, after being tortured so much, is very yeah, weak what? and tells him, you gotta come closer so I can whisper it to you. And the tyrant leans in, and Zeno bites his ear and rips it off. And shortly after, he was killed. <laughs> and so, that's one of the stories on how I came to an end. There's several others, but a lot of them are equally brutal. That pretty much... It's pretty clear that he didn't give any information to the co-conspirators. Any information about the co-conspirators to the tyrant. So, he died a pretty interesting end for a philosopher. All right, any other questions on Zeno before we get to the last one? No, we are just one. We are no separate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 8.39. Yeah, we got time. All right, so the last of the Eleatics uh, is Melesis of Samos. Now, you'll notice he's from Samos. That's the same place Pythagoras was from. That's over in Ionia. But he came over and was caught by Parmenides as well, and basically just is a parent for Parmenides. So we include him with the Eleatics. Well, as far as I'm also include him with the Eleatics. Yep, just said that. Okay, he was active in the Samanian War. Uh, so what this is is we need a map. Sorry. Huh? Wow, it's been that long. That's a terrible map. <laughs> Darn it. Okay. We remember Miletus, right? He's on the island of Samos, which is right here. Now Miletus and Samos. These are two powerhouses of trade, and they're in constant competition with each other. Now, after the Greco persian Wars, Athens ends up becoming politically powerful, and all of them fall under Athens' control. And Samos and Miletus, Boston, Samos and Miletus, they end up going to war when they're both technically under Athens' control. Um, Miletus has had a rough time up to this point, so Samos is destroying them in the war and definitely have to win it. Athens tells him, hey, you two, knock it off. Samuel says, no, you're not the boss of me. And so <laughs> war breaks out. <laughs> so that's the war. So since he's a native of Samos, he's fighting for Sam he's fighting for Samos against Athens. Athens gets involved in the war because technically they're both under Athens jurisdiction. And since Samos is the one winning the war, that's the one Athens is going against. Because they're, the, they're now the aggressors since they're winning. Obviously, you're the one that wants to keep the war going. Anyways, so that's one of the ways that we're able to date his life is because we know that he actually led a victory in this war. We'll talk more about the wars 
leading up to this, although we'll, we'll mention this one, it's almost said nothing in history. Anyways, continuing with his actual philosophy, he agreed with Parmenides about the nature of the universe, except on two counts. One, he thought the universe is infinite in size as opposed to finite. So he's not going to say it's some limited ball just there, but it's infinite in size. And the universe is eternal. Now, eternal in a different sense. Remember that for Parmenides, the universe is complete, absolute, changeless. It is like this forever. It's, it's not experiencing time. Nothing's changing. He's going to say, you're, you're kind of right. He's going to say the universe is eternal, but it's eternal in the sense that now we might think about the universe as being eternal. It existed from beginning to end. It had no start, it had no end, but time still is time as we know it. So one allows for a concept of time. The other one, the Parmenidean view, doesn't really allow for a concept of time. Uh, so those are the two big ways that he disagrees with Parmenides. Other than that, he kind of parrots Parmenides. Uh, we're going to look at some of his fragments, uh, not because the arguments are particularly great, but some of them uh, to get some experience critiquing the arguments of some of these philosophers, because he uses invalid logic now. So that's what he's useful for, is showing you bad arguments. Okay. But here's one fragment that we'll reference, one quick proof that he does basically the same as Parmenides. So if nothing is, what can be said of it as it, let me start again, sorry, my eyes get more blurry as time goes on. If nothing is, what can be said of it as of something real? What was, was ever, and ever shall be, for if it had come into being, it needs must have been nothing before it came into being. Now, if it were nothing, in no wise could anything have arisen out of nothing. So he's going to say the same thing for the universe always has been, always will be the same. So we see that his argument here for the universe being eternal is very similar to Parmenides' argument for the universe being eternal. It kind of feels a little weaker. From here on out, I'll just give summaries of the arguments. We won't actually read his arguments because it's atrocious trying to read all their language. Now, remember Parmenides talked about being. He's going to say the one because now one of the things Parmenides handles for him is all being is just one. And there's only a single being. So when he says the one, it's the same thing as being now. So proof that the one, or being, is eternal. Let's go over how it works and see the problem in the logic. All right. Whatever comes to be must have a beginning. The one did not come to be. That was from fragment one. Therefore, the one does not have a beginning. Therefore, the one extends eternally into the past. But do you see the bad logic there? If something comes to be, that implies it had a beginning. He's going to say it did not come to be, therefore it did not have a beginning. This and this are drastically different statements. Over here, he's going to say coming to be, alpha, implies had a beginning, beta. Coming to be implies had a beginning. He's then going to say, therefore, not coming to be means you didn't have a beginning. That is not true. That is not saying the same thing. Uh, if you have fire, then you have oxygen. It's not the same thing as if you don't have fire, then you don't have oxygen. You see how those are drastically different? And we're going to see that he misuses logic like this all the time. So there's two things that we talk about in an argument. We first talk about whether or not the argument is valid. An argument is valid if it uses the rules of logic correctly. And then whether or not an argument is true means it's valid and its premises are true. So his arguments, we don't even need to talk about the premises. It's the argument itself is invalid. If I were to make the argument, uh, all laptops are orange and everything orange is the sun, therefore my laptop is the sun, that's a valid argument. The premises are just false. I use the rules of logic correctly. It is true that if my laptop is orange, and if all orange things are part of the sun, then my laptop is part of the sun. The logic there is true, but my premises are false. My laptop is not orange, and all orange things are not part of the sun. You see the difference between a valid argument and a true argument? Yeah. True argument, yeah, okay. 
So we're going to see that his arguments aren't even valid. We're not even going to worry about the truthfulness of them. Okay, let's go to the next one. Whatever has a beginning must also end. If it has a beginning, it must have an end. The one did not have a beginning, therefore the one will not end. You see how he's misusing logic again? Same thing. He says something have a beginning implies it must have an end. Have a be having a beginning implies has an end. The one didn't have a beginning, therefore the one did not have an end. Bad logic. This is not the same thing as this. He's going from this to this over and over again. See that? Yeah. Wonderful. And therefore, the one is eternal. That's his conclusion he comes to you in a terrible way. Let's do another one. Proof that the one is unlimited. Whatever has a beginning and an end is neither eternal nor unlimited. Oh, sorry. I did read that right, but I thought it wrong. Whatever has a beginning and an end is neither eternal nor unlimited. Now, he's being a little bit weird here. He's applying, if something doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end, then he's saying, he, he's confusing uh, two different notions here. If it doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have an end. That means it's infinite in time, right? It didn't start and it didn't end, so it's always been. But he's also confusing it with the notion of space. He's also making it unlimited, infinite in size. And Aristotle criticizes him for this, amongst other things. So he's using an argument of it not having a beginning and end in time, that's all he really argued previously, to now be saying it doesn't have a beginning or end in space. And then being, we just proved, has no beginning or end, therefore it is eternal and unlimited. Follow his argument even though it's wrong? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Proof that everything is one. What is, is temporal, temporally unlimited temporally so it exists everywhere in time it's unlimited in its existence in time therefore nothing else temporally unlimited could exist in the same time if this if what is exists everywhere in time then there's no extra time for something else to exist in it's taking up all of time similarly it exists everywhere in space, therefore there's no extra place in space for something else to exist. So if what exists, we just barely showed it has, uh, it's limitless in size and in time, so there is no point in space and time that you can talk about for something else to exist at. It's occupying all of space and time, therefore it's one. You can't say, no, there's this other thing over here because it has to be somewhere in space and time, but the one takes up all of space and time. That's what he's essentially saying. Follow the thinking? Yeah. Okay. Uh, proof that the one is everywhere the same. Remember, Parmenides thinks that uh, not only is it all one solid stuff, but there's no way to differentiate some stuff over here from some stuff over here. It's just a plane of equally filled up stuff. So he's going to prove that everywhere in this one stuff, it's all the same. If what is has qualitative differences, some way that we can distinguish one part of it being red, part of it being blue, would be a qualitative difference. If what is has qualitative differences, it is plural. You would talk about this part has this, quali this quality, i.e. being red, and this part has this quality, i.e. being blue. So now we have two separate parts, which you can see how it's going to lead to a problem from previous arguments. What is one, what is, is one. What is, is whole in and of itself. Therefore, what is has no qualitative differences. If you have qualitative differences, those differences are applying to two different parts. What is is one, so it can't be two separate things, so you can't have qualitative differences. What does the hyphen mean anything in what is, or is that just conjoining the words? Uh, he's using what is and the one and being. He hasn't referenced being yet, but what is and being and the one are the same. Now he went from saying what the one to what is is because well, no, he could have still used the one there. Sorry. That's my bad. But what is is just being, existence, the universe, the one. What is? Everything. Anything else? That's good. Okay. Uh, proof that the one is changeless. Whatever undergoes change is altered. 
This one I didn't understand, but here, this seems to be the piece of his argument. You guys tell me if he can make sense out of this one. Whatever undergoes change is altered. Whatever is altered is not unified or whole. The one is unified and whole. Therefore, the one does not undergo any type of change. I didn't follow that one from the first sentence to the second sentence. I don't see how I follow that. Whatever undergoes change is altered. That makes sense. But then... Whatever is altered is not unified or whole. Yeah, but he's just saying, yeah, it's not saying that the one is unified. The one is unified, but whatever is altered is not unified. Why does something being altered mean it's not one thing? Well, it depends because on why you move it, you change it. You can Imagine I had all of being and I suddenly made it blue. It's all still the same. I altered it. I guess what I did. And the one can't be changed. Part of it doesn't make it's sense. Well, he's supposed to be arguing that the one is changeless here. Well, to be fair, all this stuff doesn't make sense. Yeah, but <laughs> I could kind of follow his thinking on these other ones, but this one, I'm not sure how he's making how to make that one appeal to intuition. Whatever is altered is not unified or whole. I'm not sure where he made that jump to whatever is altered is not unified or whole. Right, that's the sentence I'm saying. That's the first sentence. Altered 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 He's arguing for changelessness here. I know, but he can't say altering is a change and changelessness is impossible because that's what he's arguing for. I can't say there's no numbers that are both even and odd because if there was a number that was both even and odd, it'd be even and odd, which is impossible. Right? I understand that. That's and circular. So he did go in a cir in a circle. Well, I don't think he viewed it that way. I think that there's a way to think about it and make it make sense. I just can't no. keep it together. He it, it looks like he's implying altered as changed. Well, it's a translation from whatever words they used, but change he's saying change leads to it not being unified or whole. That's the hint of it. And I don't see how that leads to that. But that seems to be how his argument flows. All right. Proof that the one is motionless. Okay. To be empty is to be nothing. What is nothing does not exist. In other words, there's not going to be an empty nothing for something to move into. If I move, I need emptiness to move into. So to be empty is to be nothing. What is nothing does not exist. The one exists, therefore the one is not empty. What is not empty must be full, therefore the one is full. Whatever has motion is not full. Whatever is full must be motionless. The one is full, therefore the one is motionless. There's no emptiness for any of it to move into. Okay. Okay. <laughs> or the other way maybe to see it is... Since the one occupies all of space, and internally it's completely full, so there's no empty space for it to move to, then there's no motion that way as well. Maybe that's how he meant it. And then one place, I don't know why I didn't mention this earlier, one place where he drastically differs from Parmenides and differs from everyone else up to this point is his proof that the one is incorporeal. 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 <laughs> mm. Incorporeal. Sounds weird now I'm saying it. Okay. In other words, it's not physical. He's going to be the... Everyone up till now thought of everything as physically existing. Even the Pythagoreans, with their notion of everything is composed of numbers, still thought of the numbers as somehow physically making up stuff. He's going to argue that all of existence, this entire universe, has no physical existence. And that might sound absurd, but much later philosophers argue that exact same thing. That's crazy, though, because then how can you say that it's being, like that it is, if it doesn't actually Everything that is doesn't exist physically. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't. It's like your dreams, kind of. That is weird. So, that's his argument here. The one is whole in and of itself, therefore the one has no parts. Therefore, the one has no thickness. It has no parts to it. It has no thickness. Therefore, the one does not have a body. 
It has no parts. So you can't talk about the size of it. It has no parts. So it has no body. So it's not physical. <laughs> yep. There's even crazier ones than that. But Yep, there's where he drastically differs from a lot of his previous ones. So that is the end of the Italian school. Uh, next week, we'll start on the Grecian persian Wars. So whoever's doing that, make sure you're ready for that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I can show you how many slides I have, and that's as much as I can do. But after the Grecian persian Wars, we'll be starting... Empedocles and Anaxagoras. Not Anaxagoras, sorry. Anaxagoras. So. Oh, but I don't think anyone's covering any of them, right? So no one will. Oh, you'll be doing Grecian Persian Wars next week. Yeah. So that's it. Uh, any questions on anything we covered tonight? That's what you can expect for next week. And then possibly Empedocles too. There's no way we'll get to both of them. Do we need to do a recap of anything? We're all good? Yeah. What was the name of the last guy? What was it? Melesis. Okay. You can go back to like the slide that shows all the Italians, I guess. Oh, it goes, I forgot Pythagoras was his first one. Okay. There were all the Italians. So today we did Parmenides, Zeno, and Melissus, all pretty much following exactly what Zeno or what Parmenides started. So the next philosophers that we talk about will be the ones trying to now uh, come up with a coherent view that allows for change in the universe, but at the same time doesn't violate Parmenides. That and that's the verb that they're going to use. We need to not violate Parmenides, meaning we need to not allow contradictions that Parmenides pointed out to exist. So we'll see that there. We'll see their workarounds for that. Uh, any other questions? How did you get the date four seventy five? Was it like just one year or something? Oh no, uh, I think we talked about this in first class, but it's not worth. It might be worth re going over. So when we show a range like this, it's a rough range, but it should be close. When we show just a year, it means we have no clue about this person's life hardly. We just know that they were alive and kicking in this state. So we often call it their flirt. They were flourishing at this time. Okay. So some of them we have better dates on because we can associate some particular event with them. Like we know when Zeno was killed, so that helps us out there. And then we can piece some other things together from the story of his life. But then with other people, we just have like one event that we can reference to him. Like Malesis of Samos, the only thing we can uh, ascribe to him is that we know that he was a general in this battle. And we know when this battle took place. And so, man, he, he wasn't a kid there, and he wasn't an old man there, so he was kicking there. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, those of you with after credit.